welcome back to Pastoral Counseling. It's good to have you back. We've been studying the relationship that counseling has to theology, and we've come to a point in our counseling um, class that we uh, want to talk a little bit about soteriology and Christology. And this is vitally important, especially on the heels of having just discussed in our previous session the doctrine of sin, which is the essential thing that really plagues man. Uh, man does not have a problem um, primarily with mental illness. And in fact, this is something that we uh, classically have um, shown that there is no such thing ultimately as mental illness. Um, mental illness is an oxymoron because it's impossible for a person to become mentally ill because the mind cannot become ill. Now, the brain can. If there's something organically wrong with the brain, then uh, that's another issue. And there are a lot of people who have organic problems that are brain-oriented, and if that's the case, then there is real brain illness. But there is no such thing as mental illness because mental illness has to do with um, the soul. And of course, if you're a materialist and you only believe that man has a body, and he doesn't have any soul. In fact, he is, in a sense, soulless, other than just the life-animating effect of the body, um, uh, that there is nothing independent of the body. And when the body's dead, man ceases to exist. If you believe that, then, of course, you're going to believe in a false notion of mental illness. But if you believe that man has an intangible part of man, himself, that apart from the body, still exists, that intangible uh, spirit, um, that soul, as long as it's in connection with the body that exists, then, uh, obviously there is a difference between organic problems that go on in the body and what goes on in terms of the mental processes that affect the soul. Now, as long as the soul is connected with the body, as long as that's the case, then the body's going to have a f an effect upon the way in which the mind processes things. And also the mind and how it's handling life and circumstances and difficulties has an effect upon the body. For example, um, you can worry to the point where you become um, uh, tense. Uh, there's a lot of pressure um, in, and so you, your skin can break out with psoriasis or you can have uh, colitis. Even though there's nothing physiologically wrong in your body, uh, the worry that's going on in the intangible mind affects how the body is processing things. Um, you can be depressed over a long period of time, and that depression suppresses your immune system. And so you have a tendency to become sicker. You become more susceptible to diseases and difficulties if you're depressed over a long period of time. Well, how the mind processes life and deals with pressures and stresses and conflicts that goes on affects us physically. So there is this intangible part of man that affects the tangible part of man. And obviously the tangible part of man affects the intangible while the soul and the body are united together. Uh, for example, you can be in a terrible car accident and put your head through a windshield and it can damage the prefrontal cortex of the brain and you can have lasting problems, not just physical problems, but processing, processing information through especially the sensory um, processes of the body. Your neural system is damaged. It's, it's broken down the way your brain processes things as an organic entity now is damaged. So that's going to affect the way that you, you think and you process and you handle life. But by and large, um, uh, it's impossible for the, for the mind to be ill, even though the brain can be ill. There's a difference between those two. Well, as we talk about soteriology and Christology, and we move to the answer to the issue of sin, because sin is the fundamental problem that we have to deal with in counseling. Sin is not the only problem. Man also suffers uh, from things that go on in this world, not because he has any personal accountability for some kind of sin, but he may actually suffer at the hands of someone else who has sinned against him. Um, and in that case, sin in its broadest sense does have an effect upon him, even though it's not his personal sin. 
But there is an answer to that, and an answer is given in Scripture that fundamental to man's problem is this issue of sin, and the answer is Christ. The answer is salvation, or what we call soteriology. And this is really critical. If you have your Bible, um, I want you to take it just for a moment and turn over to Romans chapter 5. We're interested in verses 18 through 21. Romans chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. Here the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many were made righteous. Now the law came uh, in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, those are words of hope. Those are words for, of hope for anyone that's struggling with sin or being sinned against. Um, so when we say that, that means that Christ, who is the second Adam, the God-man, becomes our model in counseling. He is the one that we're focused on. He's the one that we want to help our counselees be like. And so we have a perfect model uh, in the counseling process that your counselee can look to, can focus on. This is... As a believer now, this is his or her desire to become like Christ. And also it means that Christ is our substitute. He's our substitute, um, our only substitute. Therefore, self-help approaches won't work. You don't need Christ plus self-affirming people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Christ becomes our substitute, and that's critical. He is not just a substitute, but he is a uh, absolute, complete, all-sufficient, atoning substitute for us. What that means is there's nothing in our own righteousness. There's no amount of penance that we can add to what Christ has already done in order to please God more fully. Christ completely satisfied God's requirement. He completely um, atoned for our sins. We don't add any of our um, actions, attitudes. Um, we don't add any of our um, self-pity or remorse or regret somehow stretched out over a long period of time to what Christ has already done in order to have God to be more pleased with us. He is the all-sufficient sacrifice for sin. He was our substitute. He paid for our sin, past, present, and future. Uh, all of that is taken care of. We see that in Romans chapter 8. If you still have your Bible open to Romans, you can go there in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, that's really critical. No matter what you've done in your past, if you're a believer, all of that is taken care of as a result of the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. So that is an all-sufficient atoning sacrifice for sin, so no amount of remorse is going to pay for a sin in addition to what Jesus Christ has already done because as soon as you believe that that's the case, then you must believe that what Christ did was insufficient. It fell short and we have to add our own goodness or our own righteous works to what Christ has already done in order to please God. That's the reason why when a person has failed and maybe even failed miserably, and then been caught in that failure, and then hopefully in some way has repented of that sin, then their sin is forgiven. They've confessed it before God. They've repented of that sin. It's forgiven. Now, even though there is an element of uh, grief over the fact that they had sinned, there's an element of remorse 
in relationship to God over the fact that they failed their Savior. They fell short of what God wanted them to do, even though that's the case. If they continue to wallow in that self-pity or in that remorse for a long period of time, then they are acting like a Roman Catholic. They're acting like somehow I have to add my regret, I have to add my remorse to what Jesus Christ has already done in order for God to see that I'm serious, that I've really changed, or in order for him to be pleased with me. That's not the way in which the Bible teaches that we do or should act in relationship to sin. Instead, um, we, Christ is our all-sufficient atoning sacrifice, sacrifice for sin. Uh, in addition to this, this also means that Christ is our ascended Lord. He's our ascended Lord. Nothing is needed apart from his work. There's no problem that he cannot solve. Nothing is hopeless. Um, he therefore conquered sin. He conquered sickness. He conquered demons. He conquered death. And then he sent the Holy Spirit into the life of the believer so that we could have victory over sin. So that we could be found faithful. That's really critical. That means that nothing then is insurmountable. I don't care whatever it is you face. I don't care how difficult the problem. If you're a Christian, nothing is insurmountable with Christ's help and the work of the Holy Spirit. It is the truth of the word of God and is the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life that they're two most powerful things in the entire universe. And when a Christian believes that, and when a Christian is committed to that, and Christian lives with that kind of a mindset, then anything that occurs in their life, whatever it may be, no matter what kind of tragedy or loss or setback or difficulty they can truly be overcomers in Christ. Now, in addition to the doctrine of soteriology and Christology is, as I just mentioned, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit is critical to counseling as well. This is called pneumatology. And the reason why this is important is because, well, first of all, he is a person. He's not a force out there in the universe, but the Holy Spirit has all the characteristics of personhood. The force cannot love. The force doesn't hate. The force doesn't become angry. The force doesn't become jealous. We live in a world where we believe, uh, where there, there are many people in the world who believe in some kind of creative force in this universe, but it's divorced of any kind of attributes of personhood. When the Bible pictures the Holy Spirit as completely uh, personable, um, part of the triunity of God, part of the Godhead, therefore, if that's the case, then counseling has to be personal. Um, counseling is not a mechanistic type of activity at all. The Holy Spirit focuses on the person and always uses the Word of God in that person's heart and life in order to bring about real changes. Uh, that's the reason why as a pastor or as a biblical counselor, you have job security because computers will never, ever be able to counsel. Um, there's never going to be that personal dimension or personal characteristics. A computer can't love you. A computer can't get angry at sin, and we should get angry at sin. Um, and in fact, just to kind of give you a little bit of an illustration of this, grab your Bible, let's go over to Romans chapter 12, just a few more chapters over from where you are. He says in verse 9, um, speaking to the Roman Christians, he said, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. And the word abhor there, it can be translated literally from the Greek language, hate. Hate what is evil. In other words, you when, when you see sin in your own life, then um, you need to turn all those negative aspects of your personhood upon that sin and learn to hate that sin. There are a lot of people who coddle their sin, indulge their sin, stroke their sin, feed their sin, 
But the Bible says here, we got to hate our sin. It's not enough to just merely stop the practice of it. Um, but we've got to turn all the negative aspects of our personhood upon that sin because God hates it, we hate it. So the Holy Spirit enables us to do that. We would not naturally hate our sin. That's not a part of our natural nature. Um, in fact, uh, part of our natural sinful nature loves sin because it indulges self. Uh, sin is incredibly egotistical. Be it is um, something that's centered around what brings me happiness, or what brings me pleasure, or my view of life, or what I like in life. That's sin. But for the Christian, it's all in what brings, brings glory and honor and pleasure to God. That's really critical. So the Holy Spirit focuses, because he is a person, on the person. And um, it's very easy in, in a counseling type of ministry to begin to view people as a problem with two legs. It's very easy to do that. And you've got to resist that type of temptation because um, people have the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Um, they, you have to treat them as a full person. They're not just a problem, uh, even though they may be a difficult problem uh, person to work with. And even though they may have difficult problems to work with, that doesn't change the fact that they are a person. We need to love them. We need to care for them. We need to minister the word of God to them. We need to exercise patience in everything that we do. Um, all of that is, is critical. Um, grab your Bible again. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5. And we are interested in verse 14. You can see this um, here. The Apostle Paul admonishes the Thessalonica, the church there at Thessalonica, um, and says, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.14, and we urge you, brothers, admonish the idol. There's our word, nuthateo, that we talked about in one of the earlier sessions. Encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak. But then he says this, be patient with them all. Be patient with them all. That's what you've got to be. And now it is a person, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our own lives that helps us to do that when we encounter counseling problems and people that are very, very difficult. Um, patience is what the Holy Spirit exercises in our life when we are sinful and we are ungodly. God is patient with all men. And if we are going to be like him in our ministry, then we too have to be patient as well. That is a personal characteristic. Computers will never be patient. Uh, robots will never be patient. Um, uh, anything that's run by a program cannot exercise those kind of personal characteristics at all. Now, in addition to that, it's really vitally important that you understand that the Holy Spirit is necessary for you as a counselor to do your job. Um, I think sometimes pastors understand this um, when they teach and preach the Word of God. They can preach sermons sometimes that are very effective sermons from a human standpoint, but for some reason, it doesn't have an impact on people's lives. In other cases, a pastor can preach a sermon that they feel wasn't very effective, but they're just trying to be faithful to the Word of God. It's not quite as polished the way some would rhetoricians would say would be polished. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit uses that to transform people's lives. I'm the same way in terms of my preaching. I'm the same way in terms of my counseling. There are times where I have gone into a counseling room thinking that I did a pretty good job, and yet... No change occurs in my counselee's life. And then there are other times I've gone in the counseling room and spent time with people and walked out thinking that I'm the worst counselor on the planet. And then God radically changes my counselee's life. All of a sudden, there's radical transformation that occurs in their life. What is the difference? What, what, what is it that makes the difference between those two things? And the answer is the work of the Holy Spirit, both in the counselor's life as well as in the counselee's life. That's really critical. <clears throat> to help you to see this, I want you to take your Bible and go back to Isaiah chapter 11. 
And in speaking of the future new covenant, in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, notice um, here the prophet Isaiah is talking about the future, about the coming of the Messiah, and about the sending of the Spirit of God. And he says um, in verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. You see how important this is to the entire counseling process? Uh, Jesus Christ was a counselor. In Isaiah chapter 9, if you go back and look at uh, verse 6, it says, for unto us a child is born, speaking of the future Messiah, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. That's the first on the list. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So it's very clear that the future Messiah was a counselor. I've heard, and I've mentioned this before in one of our sessions, pastors say, uh, I'm not a counselor, uh, or I don't have the gift of counseling. Well, every pastor is a counselor, whether he intends to be or not, even in informal settings where he's sitting and talking with people, he's giving out personal counsel if people come to them and, and ask him any, any kind of issue about life or any kind of issue in relationship to the Bible, the pastor is involved in counselor, as a counselor. Even pastors who say they don't do counseling do informal counseling. And then there are some pastors who say, well, that's just not my gift. Well, nowhere in the Bible does it say that counseling is really a gift at all. Uh, but if it was a gift, it would probably be that like um, evangelism, where there are some people who are gifted as evangelists, but everybody's supposed to do it. Um, but nowhere in the Bible does it ever say it's a gift. So even if you don't have the quote-unquote gift of a counselor, if you as a pastor want to be like the chief shepherd or the chief pastor then you're going to be a wonderful counselor too. And it's going to require the spirit of counsel in you. That's the reason why unbelievers will never be able to really effectively counsel other people. Uh, the highest trained psychotherapist, psychotherapist on the planet will never ever be able to effectively um, counsel um, anyone without the work of the Holy Spirit. At best, they can bring about behavioral changes. That's the best that they can do. But if there's really going to be heart-level changes, then the Holy Spirit has to be at work in that process, both of the counselor and the counselee. Um, that spirit of counsel has to be there. And it is the Holy Spirit that is necessary as well for us to do our job, for us to do our job, um, to be qualified. Um, Therefore, he is what we need to be qualified. Uh, being licensed by the state is not what we need to be qualified. There are many seminaries around the country who train pastoral counselors or train counselors to get state licensure. From a biblical standpoint, that's unnecessary. In fact, if you do that kind of thing, that disqualifies you from effective biblical counsel. Because what that does is it puts you under an authority system of ungodly people who have expectations of you that eventually are going to come out in that counseling. Uh, for example, here in the state of California, a licensed psychotherapist at this particular time is um, uh, mandated by state law um, uh, not to counsel anyone under the age of 18 out of their homosexuality. Now, that is... Uh, sad. So a Christian counselor who's state licensed now has a huge dilemma. Uh, if a 17-year-old young man or young woman comes to that particular state licensed person and then a one's counsel say, I don't want to be homosexual anymore, um, they, then now they're faced with disobeying the law and losing their state license um, or obeying the law and then disobeying what the word of God says. So now they're faced with a terrible dilemma. And we could cite numerous things like that. And by the way, a law like that tacitly acknowledges that counseling works because it basically says um, you can talk someone through some kind of 
talk therapy, um, out of their homosexuality. Um, it's not innate. It's not ingrained within them. It's not just, this is the way that I am. That's really critical. We know that from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul talks about some of the Corinthians themselves were homosexuals, but they were changed. Uh, they were different. They were no longer that way. So um, to believe that somehow you can be somehow a homosexual inside and then uh, yet not act it out externally and still be a Christian is not true. That's absolutely not true. In fact, let me show this to you just for a moment. Uh, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and you can see how this um, is illustrated by the Apostle Paul. Um, here he says, um, well, we'll pick up in verse 18. Uh, Flee from sexual immorality, uh, he says. Um, um, well, let's, let's start in verse 9. Uh, earlier, um, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, and such were some of you. In other words, the apostle Paul taught and believed that a person who had been characterized by these life-dominating sins, had been radically changed. They weren't the same way that they were before. They had been changed inside out, not just in terms of their external behavior. If you teach in your counseling that somehow, um, uh, as long as you don't practice your homosexuality, you can still have homosexual desires and, and kind of... Um, in, inside and even nurture those same homosexual desires on the inside, then you're basically teaching a person to be a Pharisee, to act one way on the outside uh, like a Christian. And that's the way the Pharisees tried to act. They tried to act righteous on the outside while all along they had desires on the inside that were completely different. We can see this in Matthew 5, 28. Um, that's, that, there's an implied inconsistency. There's, a, there's an implied problem there when a person is supposedly one way on the inside and yet acts a completely different way on the outside. Um, so it is the Holy Spirit that is really key in this whole counseling process to transform a person inside, um, the personal aspect. Uh, the biblical counselor does not need state licensure. Um, I've read all the arguments about Christian counselors being state licensed, and none of them are convincing at all. And none of them fit what the scripture says. We don't need the, the stamp of the state in order to do good biblical counseling. We don't need that. But we do need this. We need the personal work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in the lives of our counselee, and then real change takes place because, as we talked earlier, all counseling is pre-counseling until that person comes to Christ. All counseling is pre-counseling. Pre-counseling is evangelism. Pre-counseling is always evangelism. So that's really critical. The counselor then has to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. He understands the problems and provides solutions and power through the Word of God. He causes the new birth and then works progressively to anoint what is already there through that new birth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, if you still have your Bible there, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things free, freely given to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. That is the counseling process. And by the way, the we, if you study this within context, is the apostles. He's talking about the apostles. He's not talking about just generally all Christians. When he does refer to all Christians, he changes it to the second person. And he says, um, he talks about you as you Corinthians. Later on, as you read this through in its broader context, you can see that. So the apostles say, uh, Paul says, this is what we do as his apostles. And later on in Acts chapter 20, as we saw earlier in one of our sessions, we emulate the apostles in, 
in their style of ministry. So we do the same thing in the sense that um, we help people um, not with human wisdom. That's what contemporary psychotherapy does, even if it's a Christianized form of it. We don't help them with human wisdom, but we help what has been taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Um, that's where real, fundamental, interior, heart-level change occurs. That's really critical. So um, all of that is necessary. All of that is critical for the counseling process. Now, that brings us to the whole issue of the church, and we will deal with this in our next session.